different uh, people have different views about what mindfulness is. I'm going to share essentially uh, what my understanding is of really the fundamentals taught by the Buddha 2,500 years ago. The notion since then has gotten pretty expansive, and I find it actually is helpful to come back to the roots of things because it helps us understand what is mindfulness, what is not mindfulness, and what we can add to our mindfulness. So the essence of mindfulness, as it's classically described, has these three qualities to it. The first is an intention to be mindful. There's a deliberateness about it. Um, in deep states of contemplative absorption, such as by the second jhana in the wise concentration or right concentration element of the Eightfold Path, uh, the deliberate aspect, the deliberate applying and deliberate sustaining of attention tends to fall away. That's pretty darn deep. Even when your mind's really pretty quiet, my mind was getting really pretty quiet there, but from time to time I had to exercise a little intention to return a wandering mind. And a lovely metaphor I've heard about that is when you're uh, taking a puppy into your home and you're trying to help the puppy not wander around and you know so forth, when the puppy wanders away, you just bring the puppy back. You don't yell at the puppy, you don't hurt the puppy. In much the same way, you bring your attention back. Uh, there's a nice metaphor from Sharon Salzberg about this. She says, being mindful is like resting in a, in a lovely meadow full of space, you're abiding in the meadow, you're abiding in a way as the meadow, and periodically a train goes by, a train of thoughts, train of reactions, trains of plans, and so forth. And you just watch the train go by. Hello, train. Goodbye, train. I'm in the meadow. And then every so often, you find yourself on the train. <laughs> you're on the train. And you realize, I've been on this train for miles, <laughs> this train for many minutes, uh, hopefully not many hours. And then suddenly, though, as soon as you realize that you're on the train, whoosh, you're back in the meadow, right? That's the nature of present moment awareness. So there is a loveliness in the return. It's okay about returning. Um, it's very often in the return that we actually strengthen our muscle, as it were, of steadiness of mind. So that's the first aspect, a quality of, it, of intention, which doesn't need to feel harsh or top down. In fact, it can feel almost as if you're surrendering to, so that you're being carried along by a wholesome longing or aspiration uh, or, or, or aim in your heart. It's like your mindful heart is carrying you along, that kind of intention from the bottom up. The inside out. A second traditional element of mindfulness um, is the sense of stability of presence. There's a, there's a stability of presence and a spaciousness that can uh, include anything and resist nothing. Mindfulness itself does not interfere. It does not nudge experiences one way or another. It does not resist what's unpleasant or grasp after what's pleasant or cling to what's heartfelt. Just, it's a space. It's the spaciousness, the, the stability of presence that is spaciousness, like the sky. And uh, I like one of the traditional metaphors for mindfulness that says that our experiences, let's say painful ones, are like salt, like a teaspoon of salt. And if you put that spoonful of salt in a cup of water, stir it around and drink it, Ugh, it's pretty overwhelming. But if you take the same amount of pain, the same amount of worry about the current situation with this epidemic, the same amount of frustration about one thing or another, or the same amount of addictive craving for one thing or another, and you take that spoonful of salt, metaphorically, and this time put it in a big bucket of clean water and dissolve it and then drink a cup, you hardly taste it. The big bucket of clean water is like um, spacious awareness. It's the spaciousness in which experiences pass. And I find as a longtime therapist that establishing that spaciousness in which we're disidentified from, we're stepping back from our experience, not to numb it out or to resist it or to deny it, we're being with it, but we're being with it in a large field of presence. 
that really shifts our relationship to that difficult material. So that's a second major quality, a kind of spaciousness that has a stability to it. And third, it's sometimes in Pali, Sampajana, Sampayana, comprehension. There, without necessarily labeling with language, there is a knowing of what is experienced. So the mind is not dull. We're not just sitting there kind of spaced out and half asleep, not very comprehending. Uh, there is a clarity. There is a, um, a knowing of what this moment of experience is. Not knowing, as I said, in a conceptual way, but knowing in a direct way. So we have these three qualities that support mindfulness that get explored these days in research on the neurological foundations of mindfulness and different kinds of studies on mindfulness, including on the great guinea pigs of the social sciences, college sophomores. Uh, but this is the essence really, you know, intention, a deliberateness that becomes increasingly habitual and automatic. So it takes less and less effort to be mindful. One of the interesting findings on long-term meditators and their brains is that there's actually less neural activity in long-time medita meditators in parts of the brain, especially in the executive regions, that exercise top-down regulation of attention. And it's not that the long-term meditators are spacing out. They've actually gotten more efficient at remaining stably present and have to exercise less effort to do so. But in the beginning, at least, it's natural that there's a deliberateness. Uh, we resolve to be mindful. And there's this wonderful sense of spaciousness, kind of presence and spaciousness that is alert and awake and comprehending. So I wanna highlight a couple other things and then see what you make of all this, all right? I'll kind of open it up for discussion. Um, as I walked you through it, for me, mindfulness is properly understood as morally neutral and as simply sustained present moment awareness. That's how the Buddha taught it, in my understanding at least, of what's said in the Pali Canon, Pali being the language of early Buddhism, the Canon being that collection of teachings. So in principle, a burglar could be, mind, could be mindful, a sniper could be mindful, a person could mindfully reach for something addictive. A person could mindfully hurt another person. Mindfulness itself is not inherently moral. Some people teach that it, it is, I think it can be a, uh, it can be facilitative of the acquisition of compassion, uh, the development of, of wisdom over time, because as we remain mindful, we start to recognize that hurting other people is like hitting golf balls in a shower. It comes back to bonk us as well. But the mindfulness itself is neutral, which means that we need to cultivate and develop other things as well, such as warm heartedness or compassion or kindness that are worth doing in their own right. And as we warm the heart, as you may have noticed in the very beginning, um, we become more mindful. Compassion, kindness, warm heartedness is a factor of mindfulness, as is. Uh, the sense of things as a whole. So when we tune into our body as a whole, or even get a sense of the room as a whole, or this gathering as a whole, anything that draws us into a sense of things as a whole is akin to that spaciousness of mindfulness and therefore facilitative of it. And neurologically, as, as I explore in my Neurodharma book, and you, if you were present as part of the sitting group last year, I, I walked through the major topics in that book. Neurologically, um, when we're not very mindful, lost in thought, caught up in the future or the past, stressing and fussing, we tend to engage networks in the midline of the cortex toward the top of the brain. On the other hand, research shows that when people are in an MRI and they're really dropped into present moment awareness, accepting their experience as it is, not resisting anything, not following anything, not abstracting, not much verbal activity, really dropped into mindful presence. Activity in the midline decreases, activity in networks on the sides of the brain, the lateral network so-called, especially right-sided for right-handed people, whose right hemisphere does holistic processing, those networks get more active. And 
So things that engage the right hemisphere of the brain and other things that support these lateral networks, such as the sense of things as a whole, support the stability of present moment awareness. That's really nice. And then the last thing is that as the sense of tranquility moves into the body, as a sense of quiet moves into the mind, that naturally reduces stress activation of various kinds. And in so doing, it reduces that tendency when we're stressed to get caught up in um, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. And when we do that, we tend to lose our mindfulness. We tend to be caught up in the future, you know, what we wanna push away that we fear, or caught up in the past, what we regret or resent. Um, we're not really mindfully present. So it's possible with training uh, to be mindfully present while being quite enthusiastic and revved up but that's all kind of a higher bar, you know, that takes a little uh, training to be able to do that. Uh, so it can be, oh, we should not have screen sharing from someone. Please do not do that. I thought we set this up, you options. Okay, now we're back, very good. We normally set this up so no one can do that. So we'll figure that out for next time, no worries. So to finish my point and then open it up for discussion, uh, and I'm in here somewhere, great. Um, where was I? I know I was, oh, mindfulness, right. So when we feel that lovely tranquility, when we feel that quieting coming in, you just know it. It's a lot easier to remain steadily present. And I will finish with this kind of roadmap from the Buddha. It's this traditional phrase that you find recurring again and again. So when the, the teacher or in the body of teachings, the same instruction is given again and again, it's probably worth paying attention to. And the instruction is steady the mind internally, quiet it, bring it to singleness. There's a sense of spaciousness and presence all together, wide open, and then concentrated, which is a way of saying moving in to deep, deep, deep states of absorption. So we have steadying, quieting, and a kind of unification of consciousness, a sense of being spaciousness all together through which experiences flow. Those three steps for sure, steadiness, quiet, and coming in whew, to a sense of wholeness are very accessible with some practice in a home meditation. The concentration of the jhanas is much more likely on an extended retreat for most people certainly, has been for me, but the ability to really, really drop in deeply as I felt tonight with you, and I felt that many people were there as well, that is accessible to us. And with a little bit of aspiration, we truly can steady the mind, quiet it, and bring it to singleness. So with that, I'd like to open it up to, uh, if, you know, some people have a question or a comment. Uh, if you do, please try to be succinct just to preserve time for others. Uh, try to keep it under a minute or two. Uh, hopefully it's relevant to what we're talking about here. And I'll just kind of scroll through the screens. And if I see your hand raised, um, I'll unmute you. And then others can hear your voice and, and you can, uh, you know, speak your mind, speak from your heart. All right, I see Missy. Uh, so I'm going to unmute you, Missy. Here we go. Great. Missy B. Hey, uh, thank you so much. It's so good to be reminded of these things. Um, I've had this experience in a silent retreat, and it lasted for several days. And I'm having it again, where I can drop into a very delicious, very connected space with my body, and I can feel everything. But um, at that time, I had I was just on the other end of a you know medium grade trauma, 
and this sort of feels like a daily one. And I'm having the same experience where I have this delicious feeling and that's it. I can't, I can't, um, nothing else. There are no other trains. It really just, it's like, it's like, that's all there is. And, um, and it's like getting stuck there and it feels like I'm by bypassing a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, the bad stuff that I should be processing instead mm. of processing it. Well, first, um, when you're describing being just really dropped in, and you are the meadow <laughs> with no trains, um, that starts to sound like something that people, again, use different language for. You may have heard this term, access concentration, where there really is a coming together. It's not yet the, the very profound, non-ordinary states of consciousness of the jhanas, but it really is dropped in. I think people vary in their natural tendencies here. Um, I'm probably a mid-range meditator by nature. You know, I've had to kind of train at it. Uh, I've had people who just are, boom, they just drop right in. You know, you might be among them, I don't know. The question is that you raise is really interesting, which is, are you, is it bypassing something? And you probably know the term from John Wellwood, no longer with us, who's talked about a spiritual bypass. So here'd be my question for you, Missy, uh, kind of briefly. Um, why not just hang out in the meadow? Uh, are you going to the meadow to avoid things? I mean, yes. ultimately it's a question, what's useful for you and what you care about? It's definitely the place I go when things feel overwhelming and scary. Yeah. Um, it's like the Tara Brock, like try and feel the thing, try and feel the buzz in your hands and you feel the life in your, in your body. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely my, my first go-to. So here's a question for you. And it's a question for others too. I mean, I just kind of imagine when you describe it, a little girl, you know, pulling the covers over her head and being in her safe refuge. And it's a beautiful thing. It's okay, right? We all need refuge, especially the more the storm is raging around us, the more we want to find our little burrow you know, and hunker down. The question is, as with so many things, can you rest in this refuge and open the door a little bit? Can you let a little experience of anxiety pass through the refuge or be experienced along with this peaceful centered feeling? And neurologically, what that does is it, the term is expands the window of tolerance. That's a phrase. We get more and more able to have equanimity. In other words, tranquility is not equanimity. Tranquility is a beautiful thing. It's one of the seven factors of enlightenment in the Buddhist tradition. Equanimity, so tranquility in a sense is not having reactions. When you're in the meadow, there are no trains going by. Equanimity is the trains can go by all day long and that does not disturb you in the core of your being. Both are important. Equanimity also is one of the seven factors of awakening, but you can see the difference. So one nice thing, Missy, in your, in your own training, because I can see you're, you're, you're deep in this, it's a good thing, um, is to gradually see if you can mainly rest in this sense of refuge and all rightness and peacefulness while allowing thoughts to wander by or allowing feelings to wander by without being hijacked by them. What do you, what do you think of that suggestion? Uh, I don't wanna take up too much time, but. Yeah, um, just briefly, and I'm sure you're speaking for a lot of other people and I'll move right along here. Uh, can, you, can you imagine a sense of that? Technically, you're starting to link in my language the positive with the negative, keeping the positive bigger. I've done the Vipassanas and I've definitely had a plenty of that. Um, this particular thing is like, it's like the scarier things are, the more I feel stuck and the more those things, the, the, the trains don't go by. It's just, it's just a quiet kind of stuck place. And I don't know. Yeah, well, 
why don't I, why don't we leave it here? And, and when I think of people being in a stuck place, it sounds like immobilized, helpless, not very positive. To me, you described a, a beautiful place of peacefulness and contentment, but one that is enabled by keeping the door shut to, in effect, the rest of the world. And so I think if I'm following it correctly, and I may not, you know, here, uh, I think the exploration in general, to quote uh, Gil Fronstel talking about Upandita, the purpose of practice is to expand the range of experiences in which we're free. If we can be content and all right, only when the blanket is pulled over our head and um, you know, when we feel really cozy and safe in a particular place, that's good. That's much better than being blown in all directions. But it's not that free, you know? And so the trick then, the practice is to expand one little breath at a time, one little step at a time, so that more and more there's both. There's both this resting and peacefulness while everything else is streaming by. I mean, I'll just say briefly as I finish, um, I had a um, kind of a serious cancer scare about six years ago, I think. It was my very first melanoma, pretty virulent on the surface of my skin. Um, and for about 10 days, we did not know what the outcome was going to be. And it was such a strange experience. I felt like my mind was a three layer cake. <laughs> the surface layer was rational problem solving. What are we gonna do? I canceled all these teaching trips in Europe. You know, what doctor to see? What, you know, do I need to update my will? I didn't even have a will, what will, you know. The second layer was, oh, I just felt so scared. You know, the little being in me wanted to curl up and the body didn't want to go, right? The little soft animal. And underneath it all, I felt really in touch with a deep sense of well-being, acceptance and peace. Right? That's the thing. Can, you, can we be in, in touch with that deepest layer or ground of peacefulness like you clearly can access while allowing the other layers of the cake? <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot, Missy. So I'm going to mute you. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I see Cheryl with her hand raised. So I'll unmute you, Cheryl. I think I can do this. Hmm. I'm not seeing. You are unmuted. Are you unmuted, Cheryl? No, you're muted. Let me just see how this works. I'm not seeing the un. Where'd you go, Cheryl? You're, you seem to be unmuted, but we can't hear you. I apologize for this. I don't quite get it. We'll, fig, we'll figure it out later. I think your microphone might be off. I don't know. Okay, well, maybe we'll come back to you, Cheryl. Let's see, anybody else? Is that a hand, Gail? Gail Demert? Nope. Okay. Uh, hands? Any comments on what I've said or anything specific to mindfulness? Okay. And I'm going to deliberately, no disrespect, look for people who haven't uh, spoken in weeks past. I see Robert, Robert Brugger, or Brugger. There you go, Robert. Great. Okay, my my question is um, what you said in the beginning about mindfulness, that in itself it is neutral. Yeah. And when you say mindfulness, is this the same as attention? I mean, that's one question. And the other thing is in my own practice, it seems like the attitude towards the practice, hmm. I find it's almost like impossible to separate that from the practice. So like today I did a, I did a counting meditation mm -hmm. and I didn't like it. And then I thought, okay, I don't like this. I'm just going to do a sound meditation instead. I'm, I'm not going to listen to the person. I'm just gonna focus on sounds. Yeah. And then I thought, and then I thought, oh, and then I don't know, the thought came, oh, the, the counting is more difficult than the sounds. Instead of I don't I like it less. And as soon as I said that, I got really interested in the counting. <laughs> and then I did the counting and I was able to to go on for like I think like 20 breaths without yeah. losing yeah. my concentration. 
So, mm -hmm. so it seems like there was an adjustment in my attitude, yeah. which, which to me doesn't fit with um, the first point you made. Oh, okay. Like, like simple, so, so that's my question. Yeah, well, if I follow you right, so different people talk about mindfulness in different ways. Um, for me, I find it actually helpful to look at mindfulness in a way that I think is very close to what the Buddha originally taught, and is a very simplified but fundamental way of looking at it. In this way of looking at it, uh, mindfulness is sustained presence of mind, and it overlaps with attention. I thought that was a very thoughtful comment because we need to keep sustaining attention to remain present. With practice, the more deliberate aspects of attention, which can start to feel a little contracted, including, for example, if we're trying to remain attentive to the counting of breaths up to four or up to 10 and then starting over or down from 10 or four, um, it can feel kind of tense. Uh, and um, it, it feels kind of partial, like there's a you who's paying attention, then there's a what you're paying attention to. It's, you feel kind of divided. As you move into this um, openness uh, of open awareness and spaciousness, that sense of inner division starts to relax. And one way to do that is to have the willfulness, the deliberateness of attention fall away. Um, we can also pay attention to whether we're being mindful. So they kind of swirl together. Uh, I, I like the word presence and sustained present moment awareness. We're in the present with presence, right? So I, I think of that. To be able to stay in the moment with presence, our attitude is really important. If we are caught by a negative attitude about something we're experiencing, we don't like it or angry at ourselves that we don't like it and you know, it becomes all a mirror sometimes. That takes us away. Yeah, that takes us away. And um, so I also really appreciate the traditional teachings that you find in the, the roots of Buddhism and then you find also in the tr different traditions to appreciate the ways that happiness and love uh, are skillful means. You just, I think myself at least, and it makes sense to me as, a, as an animal that did not evolve to just drop into quiet and singleness of mind, right? Our animal ancestors, you can see versions of them in, your, in my backyard where the squirrels and the lizards and the birds, you know, are all coming and going. They're all looking around for this or that. It's when we are relatively calm and tranquil the warm heart and contented, it's a lot easier to sustain stable presence of mind, especially if we're doing a meditative training. Now, ultimately, it kind of goes to what I was talking about previously with Missy. I think it's really important to be able to be mindful in real time with a lot of granularity of the mindfulness, by which I mean a lot of real time tracking of subtle um, small parts of the stream of consciousness in a time scale of fractions of a second. Increasingly, you really can become deeply present even while there's an arising of irritation that, you know, the angry train <laughs> starts moving toward the meadow. You know, and then it goes on by. And then maybe there's the sad train goes on by. Maybe then there's the pain, you know, in your back that's continually ringing its bell. It's like that train is doing circles around the meadow. So there are different things that are happening. But more and more, you can really feel like the space in which they're occurring, the field in which they're occurring. And that is a profound difference, right? A different way. Does that also have an attitude of liking it or not liking it or being more open to it or being less open to it, to all the experiences you yeah. just named? Yeah, the way I would say is that liking or disliking uh, are qualities of experiences passing through mindful spaciousness. It's also true. So to me, liking or not liking, they just come, they just go, right? Uh, which is great. Uh, I guess I, I love that we're talking about this because I want to make kind of a key point here. 
if you find that the spaciousness of presence is alarming, painful, you don't like it, if, if you don't like the sense of sort of spacious presence, because maybe it's, it feels like dissociation or maybe it takes you back to a trauma history when you had to leave the body just to survive. Well, if that's true, it's gonna be harder to be comfortable with spaciousness and presence. So I think there's a place for finding the spaciousness and the presence to feel good in some way and to not resist that it feels good, to, to appreciate and to find, and now the good feeling could be really quite subtle, like peacefulness feels pretty good. Um, being undisturbed increasingly, right? The sky is not itself ever disturbed by the storm clouds and hurricanes and tornadoes blowing through it. Right, or even like meditating in a group like this is so much easier than if I were completely on Yeah, the that's right. And so I, I'm just inviting you. I think there's been, I'll finish on this point and take another person. Um, there is a, uh, I think a, a view in some circles that we should be grim meditators and we should not be attached to the pleasure of it and, and all the rest of that. And I think that's just not true. I mean, um, there's this language in the Buddhist tradition, a pleasant abiding. It's okay to find the pleasant abiding. And for me, it's just so peaceful. This is great, you know? And anyway, so not to turn that into some form of striving, but to say it's okay to enjoy the, the peacefulness and the freedom of, you know, stead, you know, of steadiness and quiet and tranquility. So I'll just leave it there, um, Robert. I, I don't know. I hope that was useful. I'm going to mute you now. Sorry about that. And I saw that Alexandria raised her hand. Where are you, Alexandria? Do, do, do. I may not be able to get to you. Okay. Can Any other hands? A hand up? A real hand? A physical hand? Somewhere? I'm not seeing your hand. I'm not seeing Alexandria. Maybe I'll go, oh, so I'm seeing Lorna. Okay, great. Lorna, you're unmuted. Okay, <laughs> now I raised my hand now to think, well, I did write a comment and I was saying that for me, I associate um, mindfulness is, includes its compassion mm -hmm. and acceptance, that these yeah. are really beautiful qualities that are naturally part of it because as we awaken more and yeah. um, become, it's just all there. It's like we're waking up to what's there. And then the, um, you know, any painful thoughts or like you said, the trains coming through mm -hmm. or, you know, observing and feeling. So I can feel fear now or, some some anxiety about the future but that's not my focus because as you said the spaciousness is much greater and the compassion and acceptance it's both coming to me but i'm also can give that and then my comment about the burglar is i don't think people that are doing harm i don't think they're mindful they might be deliberate and they have their plan of action, but yeah. coming from a, 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 their ego or fear, um, I don't see that as mindfulness. And then one other thing that's a shout mm -hmm. out, <laughs> I think that uh, artists and musicians and maybe people that like to knit or sew or anyone that has like a focused activity, I mean, that is, can very easily become mindfulness and, um, someone's meditation, bird watching, you know, being so focused. And, mm. yeah. yeah, well, I appreciate you saying that, Lauren. I, I quickly read your comment and um, I appreciate this, the feeling and the sense of, um, I think Tara Brock and Jack Cornfield in their training, they talk about loving awareness coming together 
And I, I, I'm, I'm fine really with that integrated um, sense of loving awareness, really fine. Uh, you know, it's not to get into the debate about it um, and, and which, by which I mean really that I respect and want to include what you brought up here, Lorna. This is a very legitimate way to talk about it and experience it. Um, I find that it's just helpful to keep appreciating that the cultivation of mindfulness itself uh, still leaves the cultivation of compassion, the cultivation of wisdom, the cultivation of a moral commitment. And, and just to keep kind of emphasizing that, because I think sometimes people can be very mindful, but not have a particularly warm heart nor have developed much wisdom really. And just all that said, I, I thoroughly, when I heard you talking about it, I could tell, oh, Lauren is really mindful. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, I wanna take, let's see, I wanna see if I can quickly find Alexandria as we finish here, just in a moment. So I'm bouncing through multiple screens and I'm not seeing Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This will just take a second. One of the great perfections of Buddhist practice is patience. And that's one thing I've really had to try to learn these days. So I don't see your hand. I don't see you, Alexandria. I don't know. I don't know if your camera's on. So I'm going to take one last person here. Um, actually, I think I should end. I think I should end. So, so surely I'm sorry. We're going to end here. Okay, so I wanna unmute everybody as we often do and let you say goodbye to everybody. And um, I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad you were part of this. And I really encourage you to keep exploring what is mindfulness for you and to explore what it's like to disengage from reactivity of various kinds into being the field or the space of mind or consciousness or awareness in which experiences flow. That's a fundamental, beautiful process.